Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Brian Kornfeld. He's the president and co-founder at Synapse Florida. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thrilled to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you guys are doing is really innovative and cool. And I think a lot of people don't realize how much innovation and really cool things and companies are actually coming out of Florida. So welcome to the show, man. Well, thank you. And I'm glad that you kind of start with that because there really is so much that goes on in Florida, whether it's in the Tampa Bay area or Miami or Gainesville, uh, um, Orlando, uh, there's so much cool stuff, gaming, medical, defense tech, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, there's a lot of game changing activities going on here. There's over a thousand people that move to Florida a day. I actually wow. did a, a study last night and 162 people move to Tampa Bay every single day. And wow. all of them need jobs and all of them um, need a lot of room in the innovation space. Uh, and there's a lot of exciting uh, activity going on. And we just, we're excited to let the world know about it. Very cool. So before we get into everything that you're doing currently, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Cool. Um, so I grew up here. Um, okay. In, it, and I know here is a, a relative term for everybody <laughs> listening out on the podcast world. Um, here, I, I grew up in uh, Clearwater, Florida, which is a part of the Tampa Bay area. So I, I'm from here. I, I'm really proud to be from here. I love this area. Um, big sports guy. So you can find me at every Bucks game, fortunately or unfortunately for my own sanity, <laughs> a lot of lightning games, a lot of Rays games, um, and, and really just love, 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 love this city. Uh, I Very think cool. it's one of the hidden treasures of the country. Very cool, man. So you went to university a few times. Walk us through what you took in university and why. So when I grew, when I was growing up uh, as a kid in, in the 80s, um, somehow, for some unknown reason, my parents let me watch the movie Top Gun when I was okay. really young. Sure. <laughs> to the point that I actually remember, I think it was my seventh birthday. Okay. I got a cat for my birthday and I named him Maverick. Nice. Um, and so um, I fell in love with airplanes at a very early age. And I came from a medical family. My dad was a doctor. My mom was a nurse. Um, my grandpa was a dentist. It, so uh, it was a little bit of a transition just in the family in itself, but I fell in love with this idea of engineering and, and aircraft. And I didn't even know aerospace engineering was a thing until I went up and I looked at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and they had a whole building for aerospace engineering. And in the back corner, there was this airplane and it was a student built airplane, student flown for student project in a national competition. And, and Right there, I was hooked, and I knew that that was going to be my next path, what I wanted to study, what I wanted to learn about, and um, I, I was thrilled to be able to get a bachelor's from the University of Michigan and a master's from the University of Florida in aerospace engineering, um, really because it, it, it still, to this day, um, aircraft, satellites, aviation remains a passion of mine. Sure. Um, although a lot of people will tease me that they say that I did this just so I could go around and tell the world that I'm a rocket scientist because <laughs> I, I, at, cause it just so happens that I like to tell the world that I'm a rocket scientist. Uh, Fair enough. I, well, I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife tells me I'm only allowed to say something's not rocket science once a day. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm sure by the end of this interview, um, I'll, I'll get through my one for the day. That's awesome. No, but, and I think too, it's become so common in the media nowadays with all the Mars talks and, and the recent kind of landing on Mars again. And like, I, I think it's more and more kind of in the public eye, maybe it, that it, it, it seems like it kind of went through a lull for a while, but it seems to be a lot more kind of 
popular now in, in and in more pop culture. So I, I think it, it's very cool that you get to talk about that kind of all yeah, the time. It, it's it's the nerd revolution we're taking yep. over. Um, and a lot has to do somewhat, in all honesty, with the Big Bang Theory, the, sure. the TV show. They've romanticized uh, the nerds of the world um, and taught and brought out the comic books and toys and things that people play with. And I actually wasn't a big comic book guy growing up okay. um, at, at all, but it's become a cool thing again. And Comic-Con San Diego, just look at that and the transition that's taken place there. Yeah. It's now one of the hardest tickets to get in the country for any event, period. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool, man. So walk us through your career up until what you're doing now, because you have a really interesting journey how you got to where you are now. Yeah, cool. Um, so I started, uh, after getting a master's, I moved out to Los Angeles. Okay. And I worked with Northrop Grumman, and I was pre-flight testing satellites. And um, you can learn so many lessons by testing satellites, but one of which is perfection. And okay. because if you put a $500 million satellite out into outer space and that thing breaks, you've just sent a $500 million piece of space <laughs> junk that the taxpayers <laughs> paid for into outer space. Sure. And, and that's a, there's a lot of pressure there and there's a lot of redundancy that has to happen, a lot of process improvement, data collection and analytics to, make sure that everything is really, really, really perfect. Um, so they're a really, really, really good lesson for a lot of people to learn um, on what it means to truly stick to something and make sure that it's going to work no matter what. Sure. Um, it was a great first job, especially as a 24 year old. Um, and, and to be able to say that I, a part of programs that launched multiple satellites into outer space, um, that in itself, could be somebody's career and lifelong sure. accomplishment. Totally. And that, that was age, I think, 25 or 26 wow. for me. So I was, uh, I, I was already well, well positioned, well on my way, and, and very proud of what I was doing. Sure. Um, at, at the time when I was living out west, um, it, there was always something a little bit missing, and uh, there was a family issue back at home. And, and California never quite felt like home to me. Um, okay. As much as I loved living out there, I had a great one-bedroom apartment right across the street from the beach. Nice. Um, just there was something that always drew me back to wanting to be in the Tampa Bay area. And so finally, uh, in July of uh, 2009, I decided my parents were out visiting me, and I said, now, nah, you know what, I'm going to move out back east. Told them right there. Um, of course, uh, one week after that, I went on the first date with the woman who ended up becoming my wife and I couldn't stay out in California forever with her. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm still so thankful to this day that she decided that I was worth it to, uh, to follow to Florida, even though she had never lived anywhere other than California. Um, after I moved a couple months later, um, and, um, it, I'm in debt to her for the rest of our life, uh, for, <laughs> sure. for that. But something, uh, getting to know her, getting to know her family was really interesting. And something really interesting happened right before I moved back. Um, her father, we were sitting down talking, and he looked at me and he said, so, so just got to ask you one, one real question about Tampa. Like, okay. okay, and I don't know what he's going to ask about. Maybe it's hurricanes. Maybe it's what do you do there since he, you don't know much. It's maybe how do you make money there? What industry is there? And he looks at me with a dead serious face and goes, what do you do about the alligators? Like, what, do, okay. what do you mean? Um, you know, I played golf growing up, so you see alligators in the lakes, and they never bother you. They leave you alone. But his response was, you know, when you're, like, taking a run down the street or you're driving your car and an alligator chases you, what do you do about it? And now I'm having these visions of Hollywood movies of alligators going sure. 75 miles an hour and jumping on cars <laughs> and getting through my sunroof. Um, but that it, that really was an eye-opening moment to me because um, I noticed that's the way people think of Tampa and Tampa Bay. It is, Interesting. We get chased by alligators down the street. Um, and that's, <laughs> this is 2009. This isn't like the 80s when it's not like it, there was a ton of TV. Um, and right then and there, I almost thought about myself in a way of what can I do to change the world's view of Tampa Bay? And, and how can I leave my mark? And, and how can I be a part of this? And I didn't quite have the answers then and at that time. 
but it was always a challenge in the back of my head that I always wanted the rest of the world to know that we're a lot more than retirees, hurricanes, and alligators. Sure. And so, but, um, it, but, but sorry to interrupt you, but it is kind of cool not being from Florida, but I've been to Florida many times. When you're driving down the highway that there is like alligators on the like side of the road in the ditch, just there's like water or something. Of course. That is, it, it's really cool. And, and they look like big tires sitting there. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. realize it at first. Totally. Um, it, it's part of our aura. It's part of sure. what we have here that no, <laughs> well, other places in the world do have alligators, but, um, and they're not going to bother you as long as you're not swimming at dusk in a lake and you're treading sure. water. Um, uh, there's a lot of safety tips, but if you're just walking down the street, you're not going to get chased by an alligator. But yeah, you can drive up to a bunch of lakes, especially on a cold but sunny day, and they'll just be sitting right out on the banks on the side of the lake, uh, leaving the world alone and tanning like everybody else does at our beaches. <laughs> Very cool. So walk me through what exactly is Synapse and, and how did it come to be? Yeah, so um, uh, I'll... I'll go through the story of how it came to be and that'll drive right into what it is. And so, Perfect. and even more of my transition too. Okay. I, uh, so when I came back here, I was working for a small defense company and the defense company just was uh, struggling in the three years that I was there. So I then left and I went to Nielsen and Nielsen is the big uh, data ratings company, yep. most known for yep. the Nielsen ratings. I was accepted into an executive training program there. Um, okay. At the time I was doing my MBA, it was a two-year rotational program, a very cool opportunity. Um, and after two years, graduate and become an executive. Uh, after two weeks uh, of being in this program, I was in training. And uh, the trainer was talking about process improvement and um, how you do data-driven decisions by guess and check methods. Okay. And, and I told him that doesn't make any sense. Uh, like, how, why would you use guess and check? It, it, it's data-driven decisions. Don't you use the data to help get you to the decisions? And his response was, well, if you go fishing and um, normally you find fish in the back left corner of the lake, are you going to go and drop your line in the back left corner of the lake first? To which I responded saying, uh, well, what if you're only allowed to drop your line once? Are you still going to go to the back left corner of the lake first? He was like, yeah, absolutely. I said, well, what if your family, uh, feeding your family is dependent on it? Are you still going to go to the back left corner of the lake first? He said, yes. And I said, that's nice. I'm going to go to a tackle shop and a dive shop. I'm going to get a mask, uh, fins, snorkel, and a spear gun, and I'm going to make sure I have that fish. And good luck on your 50% of feeding your family. <laughs> well, the, interesting. The, the next day, and I know that makes me sound a, a little smug, um, but there's something to that and something to being able to have open discussion and not yeah. thinking that, okay, I'm the trainer and it's my way or the highway, that it really just, it didn't work. And I, the next day I had a senior vice president tell me, you're not going to get along here. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you are way too apt to question authority and that does not fly in this business. And um, honestly, that doesn't fly by me. I, I don't really want to be a part of that. It, it's, I like being in places that we can challenge each other. I like being in places sure. where we can grow. And, and it's not, and I actually got told this by an executive uh, at Nielsen, um, I was told that Nielsen really runs by what's called the HIPPO culture, and HIPPO stands for highest paid person's opinion. And, and, ah. and that's just, it. that doesn't fly with somebody with an entrepreneurial mindset. So, Well, I don't I think, think that really flies necessarily in kind of the, the new modern world. No, in a lot of no, no, not at all. <laughs> There's a lot of people who that rubs the wrong way to. And, sure. Um, and so all this whole time, it, it was, um, all right, let's make sure that we're, uh, we're, we're, I'm doing the right things and setting myself up, myself up accordingly. In the meantime, I'd always had a ton of business ideas okay. and, and always, I never thought to launch them. One was concerts at home and, um, other methodologies for advertising, um, and one business idea and one concept always stuck with me in terms of regret. And this was back in 2008. Um, okay. I was living out in California at the time. I was up in New York, though, for a wedding. And I had taken the red eye in. So I was around New York City for the day and needed a ride out to Westchester uh, to get to the rehearsal dinner. And my friends were giving me a ride, texting me saying, hey, where are you? We need to leave. Okay. My response to him, and I wish I had saved this text message, but it was back on my BlackBerry before iPhone existed, was... Right. I wish there was a wet, I can't get a cab, 
I wish there was a way on my phone I could point on a map, say where I am, and have a cab then directly come to me and pick me up. <laughs> this was a couple of years before any ride sharing existed. Sure. Now, I, now, I didn't think of the whole ride sharing aspects of it, but the idea of the map calling the cab was far fetched at that time frame. Sure. And, and it's always stuck with me as something of, wow, why didn't you do this? So when I was doing my MBA at, at the University of South Florida, um, I was, um, uh, I showed up and it was an executive program. And at the time I was managing a small team. Okay. Um, and, um, but I was probably the most junior person in the class. And, and the first day I showed up for lunch and I was sitting next to a partner at Price Waterhouse Cooper and a CEO of a huh, commercial HVAC business, okay. um, uh, that does a couple million dollars annually in revenue. And I was pretty intimidated, got into the first class and I said, uh, I'm just not going to do this. I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm not going to sit back and wait. And at, at that point, I said, I'm going to start to lead this. And so I started participating a lot in the discussions and standing up. And by the end of those two years of the program, the class was looking at me to be the one in front of everybody giving speeches on behalf of the class and leading the class. And I was elected to be president of the class advisory council to the whole uh, university uh, for the MBA program. And so I realized that it was just really a confidence thing in me and that I could do this. And finally, now I have some of the business skills to go with my engineering background and I'm going to start a company. And now it's just a matter of what. Okay. So I, uh, at the time, you know, my wife and I, we were planning a vacation to go up to Nashville for a couple of days over the holiday. And she looked at me and she goes, uh, um, where should we go eat? Um, when we're there, I'm like, I don't know. Let me ask a couple friends. She goes, hold on, let me post on Facebook. So she okay. puts a post on Facebook saying, hey, where should we go eat when we're in Nashville? And I said, hey, Marcy, uh, why are you posting that on Facebook? Why aren't you going to Yelp or TripAdvisor or any of the other resources that could get you answers a lot faster? And her response was, I trust my friends more than I trust the general public. And that hit it right there of what the the first business that I wanted to launch. So I conceptualized a personalized recommendation engine. Okay. And, and this recommendation engine would help get you what restaurants you should go to and where you should stay and what doctors you should reach out to and contractors and so much in the entertainment space of things to do that you would get from your friends or friends of friends in an automated fashion. And that way you could actually have those follow on conversations of what that should look like and why. And, and where you should go and your friends would be the ones providing it. Really good idea. Um, terrible execution in, in the way that I launched it. And uh, I'm always happy to celebrate this as a colossal failure. And, and I like talking about this because there was a ton for me to learn and I did not use the resources that were around me to learn enough or talk about UX uh, in a better way. It was all just based off of my own trials and tribulations and going for it and trying to figure it out on my own and not building a team. And um, I wish I had done things a little bit differently there, but at the same time, I'm really happy that I didn't. Um, but one thing that did come out of it in a positive spin was um, when I first went to go launch, I talked to a couple of my friends who were successful in the startup world and they told me it was okay. going to cost me 150 grand to build this. Wow. Um, and I just said, nope, don't, don't have that kind of got discouraged. But then I said, you know what, there's gotta be a better way. Put my mind at work. And I figured out how to build it for seven. Like, wow. all right, that, that's a nice discount. And this, Did you this, offshore it? Uh, it was actually, I didn't want to do the offshore thing on its okay. own because I'd heard so many horror stories about offshoring. Sure. So I ended up doing a mix of onshore offshore, uh, where okay. I had senior developers onshore and junior developers offshore. Um, uh, interesting. And, and so that's how I was able to really cut down the cost um, because about 85% of the work really could be done by junior developers. And if I could find right. a, two junior and one senior developer who could work together um, and who could make this all happen, that's how it could really uh, come together. And, and so that then got me into wanting to start a software development company because I knew there was other people like me sure. who had great ideas but didn't have $150,000 to get them to market. And, and to me, having been the person with ideas that I didn't take to market, I've always found that to be tragic, uh, letting those sure. ideas die. Yeah. 
And, and I wanted to enable the community to really, really be able to get those ideas to market. So I launched my software development company, was profitable from an early state, um, and started to meet a lot of people. And it really started to become its own little incubator because what I realized is a lot of people have ideas, but they also have this concept of build an app, become a billionaire, build an app, become a billionaire, build an app, become a billionaire. And, and that's just not reality. And, and that was a hard thing to explain to people is there's a lot of work that has to go in between when you first launch and when you first build something yeah. to when you start to get money. And not everybody these days is going to get money by advertising uh, and yeah. ad revenue. It, it's just not the way of the world. So um, I really helped people build and grow some businesses and get them off the ground. And that helped me learn very quickly uh, some really cool things about building businesses and how to build and run startups um, and a lot of really great lessons and how to build teams and how to cap, uh, capitalize on your own weaknesses. Um, so there, there's some, a lot of great things to learn and there's a lot of great ways to help build the business. At the time, though, the Tampa Bay market was still very disconnected, very disjointed in terms of startups uh, and a lot of the conversations I had sh uh, were showing me this, that there was a lot of questions, and I kept wondering why Tampa Bay was not being compared to on the same level as, say, Austin, Boulder, Nashville, San Diego. Um, right. It was actually being ranked nationally behind such powerhouses as Iowa City, Lincoln, wow. Nebraska, and Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and no offense to those cities, but um, I would in my mind, I would think that Tampa Bay is a larger market and sure. it is a larger MSA. And so I was wondering why we were not getting more credit nationally in terms of entrepreneurship. So I started, that's when I really started digging in and diving into some research in the innovation space um, and trying to figure out what was wrong with it. Um, right then, you know, there's sometimes where stroke of luck and serendipity takes place. Um, I had my, one of two strokes of luck over the course of about a two month span of the summer of 2016, um, where one of them, I went to a talk by a guy named Jeff Finnick. And uh, okay. if the name isn't familiar, he owns the Tampa Bay Lightning and between him and Bill Gates are putting in about $3 billion into real estate in downtown Tampa and completely revitalizing downtown Tampa. Look up Water Street and what's happening. It, it's amazing. It's going to be Tampa's first five-star hotel and offices, a whole live, work, play area. Uh, and it'll be very similar to what Pitt happened in Pittsburgh and Seattle and some other markets. Um, so I went to hear him talk, figuring it was going to be a lot about real estate and hockey, being a hockey fan. And sure. he talked for 20 minutes about this idea of an innovation hub. And okay. I just, I kind of said, I got to help. Some way or another, I got to help. So I went up to him, I asked him, hey, is there anything I can do to, to help out? I'd love to share with you some of my findings being in this market. He gave me his card. And um, I, I always say, if I had written him an email and he had passed me to a staffer or I never heard from him again, or he just said, thanks, I don't have the time, I never would have batted an eye, never would have th thought twice. And I would have been so appreciative of even talking to me for one minute on that day. Totally. Yeah, um, very cool. But so I sent him an email. I waited three days to send him an email. Uh, like a guy meeting a girl, you wait three days before asking her <laughs> on a date. Um, I, ended sure. up, uh, I ended up waiting three days and he wrote me back within an hour saying, let's sit down and have a meeting. And, and right there, it was just like, okay, now the work's got to begin. And now we got to really do the research on this. Um, and actually his assistant then reached out to me and, said, and, and asked me, um, hey, do you have an assistant that I could work with? And, and I really debated... Uh, creating an email address for my wife to, uh, to pretend to be my assistant, just so uh, I looked a little bit more professional and further along sure. in what I was doing. But uh, instead, I went with, uh, now nah, this meeting's too important. I'll, I'll plan it myself. Um, so well, that makes uh, sense, though. Like, yeah, I, yeah, it was smart. It, 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 was, a, it was a quick one. Um, very happy behind that one. Um, so... That's when I really started doing research, though, and, and what we could do better. And the fact that we weren't necessarily focusing on our core industries and people weren't building companies for customers and, and the corporations needed to get further engaged that were already here. And uh, the talent just isn't connecting well. And the investors aren't connecting well with the potential investments. Um, and, and so he took that and uh, went away. Um, and we've kept in touch since. But at the same time, um, about two weeks after that meeting, I got invited by a, a camp friend to a 4th of July party. 
okay. at his father-in-law's house. And I knew his father-in-law was uh, um, a successful entrepreneur in the area, but didn't really know much about him. Um, and so we started talking. And, and as it turned out, um, he was now running a local crowdsourced investment fund. Okay. And he was wondering why it was so hard for, as an investor, to connect with the right investments. And he was doing the exact same research that I was, but from the investor perspective. And, and immediately I said, that's it. Like that, there we go. Right now, we're doing the same thing. Let's join forces. And, and that gentleman, Mark Blumenthal, is my business partner now with Synapse. And uh, um, that first 30 minute meeting that ended up lasting two hours where we were drawing out on a whiteboard, all these possibilities and places we could go and things we could do. Um, but really focused on how do we build this community and how do we make this happen for the community and how do we really enable the community to, uh, to grow to a business success that they haven't seen before. And that meeting right there um, was around the July, August, 2016 timeframe, just set a course towards uh, towards where we are today that we have not turned back from. It's been so exciting. It's been so fun to be a part of this. Um, and we, you know, we've learned so, so much along the way, but what we've seen is if we can enable the connections, we enable people to share what they have and to connect to what they need and help guide people and give them a logical next step of where they should go and what they should do, that there are so many resources here, especially in the state of Florida, um, in a business friendly state uh, and in a state where there's some amazing innovation, game changing innovation, like magically going on down out of Miami, right. yeah. that, that there's no end in sight for what we can do. Sure. Um, and all it took was, all it's gonna take is a little bit of framework and a little bit of umph and people to rally around one organization who can really help be the center of this and be that guide of this. And that's all we want to do. Uh, you know, there's the saying, the rising tide lifts all boats. If we could just be the tide, it makes everybody in this community that much stronger. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And, and that's, that's really cool. But I, I want to dive deeper into what exactly you guys are doing. Because sure, it's for the local community. But I think anybody that would go to any of your events or the summit would benefit whether they're in the area or not. Fair to say? Yeah, at, at 100% absolutely true. Um, so diving into it the next level, um, one of the things that we did and one of the pieces of research that we did or that we got was this article called The Power of Five from Ernst & Young. Um, and it talked about how there's a framework behind these innovation communities. And a lot of people don't realize that. They just think Silicon Valley is there because Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley has always been the, uh, the most innovative community in the country. Um, but really, if you think back, before Silicon Valley existed, the most innovative community in the U.S. was Detroit. Um, and Detroit um, hit bankruptcy. It hit rock bottom a couple years ago during the recession. So. Yep. It, Silicon Valley is not always going to be Silicon Valley, but there's a reason it's there. And what this article talked about is, is the power of five. It talked about these five personas of the ecosystem and, okay. and that there's five different groups that really make an ecosystem thrive. The entrepreneur, the investor, the educational institution, the government, and the mature corporation. And they all have very specific roles and they all need to do the right thing. And if they work together and they, then they all provide each other an um, equal value. Um, and what it talked about is that in Silicon Valley, uh, everybody rallied around the educational institution of Stanford. And, and one of these personas in each of the, and every market is always the rallier. It's always the igniter. And so Silicon Valley, really people came around Stanford. And in Boston, it was MIT and the educational institutions at Harvard. In Chicago, it's the hard-nosed entrepreneurs. In New York, it's the money. And then it talked about Cincinnati. And Cincinnati is always the page in the article when you say, ah, the plot's now thickening because you don't realize, a lot of outsiders don't realize Cincinnati has a, such a thriving innovation economy, but it does because the corporations are the ones who stepped in and said, uh, we're not gonna die a painful death the way some of our competitors have. Um, and I'm, the corporations I'm talking about are like Macy's and Procter & Gamble, um, Kroger, for example, the consumer product goods space is getting thrashed in the United States, especially with the online retail. Uh, and they looked at Circuit City going away. And now Sears and Kmart were, are on the downward track. 
um, they said, we're going to do something differently. So they wanted to get the local innovators involved and they are the ones who really kickstarted this. And they did it by putting on these innovation challenges where they took their biggest problems and they crowdsourced the solution for prize money to the local innovators. And what they started to see was the local innovators then were the ones who came up with these great solutions. They got solutions faster and less expensive by orders of magnitude. Um, and then they were able to invest further in the innovators and the innovators then grew and they built themselves up to be uh, companies that they then could sell. Um, there was an M&A pipeline. There were specialized incubators that were being built. This whole economy got built around these innovation challenges all because the corporation stepped up and it created a capital fusion in Cincinnati like no, mar no other market had seen before. Um, so we now looked at this article and we said, okay, now what's the framework got to be for Tampa Bay and for the state of Florida? And, and we took those, um, those five personas and we actually added three more. We added the entrepreneurial okay. support organization, accelerators, incubators, and co-working spaces. We added talent and talent is a huge deal here between student talent, those in between careers, potential co-founders, mentors, developers. Um, and the innovation enablers, lawyers, the bankers, the accountants, software development companies, people who are helping those build and grow. And, and that together really built, builds a framework um, of how this whole community can work and thrive together. And we said, all right, well, now if we have the framework, now we need the how. How is this framework going to happen? How is it going to come together? And, and we decided in three ways it is really how this needs to take place. Uh, the first is actually with using those innovation challenges, and we've become a marketplace for them locally and around the state where companies are coming to us, um, and it could be companies that people have heard of from all over the world, like potentially soon we're going to be launching one with the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, we're in talks with the Tampa Bay Bucks, and those are sports teams. Um, they're not necessarily known as innovators, but they really, really do things in new and innovative ways. Um, so that marketplace is taking off. We built a web platform that's a, similar to a community platform that people would see, but we built it in a custom way to make it easy for people to get around and to find what they need at, on, at a 24-7, 365 time frame, um, but also based on some filterable criteria. So if you think of kayak.com and going to look for a flight, some sure. people want to fly on the morning of November 29th if for the cheapest flight possible. Some want to fly anytime November 29th, as long as it's United Airlines. Some don't care as long as it's nonstop. And some just, and everybody has a different hypothesis when they go and they set themselves up. So it's the same thing in the innovation space. It might be a location where you want to do business or sure. an industry or technology or a stage that you want to do business with or a group that you want to do business with. And that's how we set this up. So you can filter at the at a quick point and click to instantly see um, what you're looking for and to instantly grasp groups that really fall right within your own personal hypothesis. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I was I was actually playing with the platform um, before we kind of started recording just to see what it it is it is interesting what you guys are doing and i think it makes a lot of sense right and and just being involved in in the community are are you guys going to eventually though open it up to people outside of florida i i guess they could use it currently but are you guys going to bring it around um there's um there's conversation of that it's okay. not um we're not 100% sure yet after florida Okay. Um, we've talked with people like David Rose from gust.com yeah, sure. um, and he loves what we're doing and it actually builds on top of what they're doing. So there's that possibility, but we really do want to focus here locally first um, at, or at least first to under, make sure we um, can understand, make sure that we're perfecting this. There's still lessons that we're learning on an everyday basis, um, at how to connect the community just that much better. Sure. There's a lot that we can do um, and but if we can successfully connect this state and keep going on this path, I have, I don't see why we cannot then connect Florida more to the rest of the country in a way that we can could a lot sure. easier. 
No, that makes a lot of sense. I, I guess the thing that's always been interesting to me is the geographic boundaries. I, I get I get it. Obviously, it, it makes sense. But in a lot of cases, especially with startups, it, 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 they're almost irrelevant, right? You like you and I are talking right now and we're in two different countries and it doesn't really matter. We could be down the street. We could be in the same office building. It, it doesn't really matter. So it, it's interesting because I think a lot of the stuff that you guys are doing with anything, including the platform, could be useful to people inside and outside of Florida. So I, I, I think it's cool if eventually you guys move it outside of there, but I, I get what you're trying to do. Like makes sense to focus on your core mission inside of Florida and then move it out. Makes total sense. And we would love it. Uh, we don't see why not. They're really, yeah. it's 2018, it's almost 2019. Yeah. Like we're not in the yeah. days of Hal and, and 2001 A Space Odyssey anymore. We're not in the days of this, of the Jetsons. I mean, we really can connect virtually at the drop sure. of a, a penny and no mm -hmm. cost to do business anywhere in the world, there's a lot of very cool opportunity for us sure. um, that we can take advantage of and that we should take a lot of good advantage of. No, it makes total sense. So you okay. guys do a bunch of events throughout the year, but you guys also have the summit coming up. So. Do you want to talk about the different types of events and the summit that you guys kind of do every year? Yeah. So um, really, and I guess I didn't get into this. The third thing that we do is these purpose-driven events and it's okay. to get everybody under one roof at one time and to make those purpose-driven connections. And we set up, especially our summit in, in a much different way than anyone else has really ever done an event. We do it in a hockey arena okay, and, and the hockey arena is not a typical convention space, but it means we can set up a stage like a concert and make it right. like rock stars. It means that we can um, have a different type of exhibition. It's more around uh, the arena, not on the floor, but around the, the concourses. So you're going around in a loop where people are running into each other and having those day-to-day -day collisions that you might not necessarily get everywhere unless you have a very central downtown that people are walking by all the time. Right. And we saw a ton of success with our first event uh, this earlier this year in March in 2018, where we had multiple companies get investments. We had people get jobs. We had students get placed. We had cool. people get customers. But the coolest thing that we saw on the needle getting moved is we had people inspired to move here because of that. And, and that's not something that takes place uh, all day, every day. And so that um, that really was an eye opener for us that something special is now happening and right. people were really motivated by the thought leadership that they heard from our stage, whether it was the, the CIO from IBM or Jeff Finnick himself or the CEO of a company called ConnectWise, uh, a local billion dollar company or the CEO right. of uh, Hyperloop, a company that's doing 700 mile an hour trains based right. out of California. But now because they came here, they're doing case studies on potentially building one between Tampa and Orlando. Interesting. Um, so some really, really, really cool things. Some amazing outputs take place out of that. We're doing it again January 23rd and 24th, 2019, back at Amley Arena. Um, if anybody's interested listening to learn more, check out SynapseSummit.com. And that is uh, that will get you all the information that you need. Um, especially those of you up in Canada, if you need an excuse to come to Florida in January, this should be it. <laughs> yeah, um, <fair> enough. <laughs> we're, we're really excited. Um, the first year we did this, we aimed to have 1500 people and okay. hundred exhibiting tables. We ended up with almost 3,500 people wow. and 257 exhibiting tables around the arena. Wow. Um, a lot of early stage startups, a lot of companies that we just said, Hey, come show off your tech, like show off the cool stuff that you're doing, put it on a table let people put on your virtual reality headset. Um, we theme the corners based off of our core industries like defense tech and blockchain and fintech and AR, VR and AI, um, healthcare. Um, we had a lot of really great outcomes from that and a lot of good excitement. Um, and we're really looking forward to taking it to the next level and having 5,000 people and having 300 exhibitors and more and more, uh, the bigger we can make this, the better. One of the cool things about doing this in a hockey arena is there's 19,000 seats. So right. we got, we have plenty of room to grow. Sure. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Interesting. And yeah, well, no, you're right. Because that's the thing, right? Is 
at some point, most conferences almost have to stop selling tickets because they run out of space. But obviously, you guys, it's almost a non-issue, right? Like, obviously, you could potentially get that many people, and that would be awesome. But you, you have, a, like you said, you have a ton of room to grow. No, that's, that's really cool. So walk us through maybe a little bit more of the other events that you guys do throughout the year. Uh, we do other events, um, whether they're networking or thought leadership events, um, co-promotion of other events okay. that take place. Um, it, we're, just, we're just a part of the community. We really want to okay. make this community engaged um, 24-7, 365. It can't just be one event. We partner with organizations that put on Tampa Bay Startup Week, which is a week right. of free events for the earlier stage entrepreneurs, and Startup Weekend, which is a long weekend of... Uh, from Friday to Sunday, where on Friday, people come up with ideas for companies and build teams. And by Sunday, they have working prototypes. Very cool. Um, there's a ton of cool things that go on. Um, and as long as the connections are happening, and as long as we can find ways to get people to learn and to yeah. find out about the great things that take place, and there's education involved, we are a, a part of that and and we some of them we're putting on and some we're sharing with other local organizations who are just doing a phenomenal job themselves no very cool you guys also published a book do you want to talk about that because i i don't think i've never really heard of a book talking about the stuff you're you guys are doing and, and kind of did with the book so do you want to talk about what you yeah, uh, yeah, pretty innovative that, in itself. That, no, that really is uh, the the fourth piece of our puzzle, um, and it's a book called Innovate Tampa Bay. Uh, and the thought process behind it is the old is cool again, uh, the old is new. Sure. And this idea of coffee table books has gone away recently, where a lot of people are going digital. Yeah. But it's this really nice, almost like a yearbook, but a coffee table book where companies and thought leaders and innovators and universities here can all um showcase the amazing things that are that they are doing and it's finally the first way for people to really get that time of day that they don't normally get and that opportunity to talk about great things that they're doing that they don't normally get um that in itself is uh it is just cool on its own Sure. But the stories about what's taken place from that are, uh, I mean, they're motivating because people, when they're not in it, they want to know how do they be in it next year. Uh, we met with the mayor of Tampa a couple months ago and we gave him a copy and it actually completely derailed our meeting because all he did the rest of the meeting was flip through it. Um, Interesting. We, we met with the largest grocery store chain in Florida, which is the second largest company in Florida. And they called us two days after saying, hey, which drone company in this book should we call so we could do some drone photography? Cool. Um, th that's the thought process of people. Yeah, interesting. Well, it seems like, and you can give me your thoughts on this, that there's been obviously a ton of innovation online and there will continue to be, but I think, and maybe it's not the next wave, but it, it's one of the up and coming waves, I think, is actually going back into the physical world. People... I think part of the problem now is like you load up Netflix or something and you could spend 30 minutes just trying to figure out what to watch and then you just give up and go do something else where if you get a physical copy of something, you're way more likely to, to spend the time and effort and kind of check out and totally focus on that physical thing. Or, you, or another good example is Amazon going back into the physical world with their ghost stores, right? And yep. so what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I personally love it. I, I think there's something that, you know, we started to miss for a little bit uh, over the course of the last 10 years and going too digital and going too much into uh, yeah. the social media world and everything has to be right away. Now, there's some great things about it and there's great ways now to get news and to stay connected with people that you never had the opportunities to before. Um, but also, if you think about it a little bit, um, I was watching a, a TV show called Hard Knocks where they okay. were chronicling uh, the Cleveland Browns in preseason, uh, the football team. And a player in there was talking to other teammates about Instagram. He was like, okay. you realize if you spend two hours a day on Instagram or on social media, that means you're spending one twelfth of every day on social media, which means you are spending one month out of every year on social media. 
Wow. So one month of your life you are taking and giving to social media. Now that when you just think about that statistic in that way, and I'm guilty of it, but I, like, I will be the first one to say that I'm a hundred percent guilty of it myself. And I, I always kick myself a little when I say that, um, but to get out of that realm and to actually get more into the personal realm and start having those personal conversations and something that's physical and, and in the space and some, some type of real heart to heart connection, you can't get that necessarily over Facebook or over Instagram yeah. or over Twitter. And that's always something that I encourage with a lot of people. No, I, I, yeah, it's interesting, right? Because I, I don't know, like, I, I'm a bit torn about social media. Obviously, I do it for the show, but you're right. You can get sucked into that. And and I, I think if people spent the same amount of time they did on social media to actually doing their own company or chasing their own passion or putting it into a hobby that they enjoy, I think they would be better off. And I'm not saying that's all the, always the case, but I think you don't realize how much time you don't necessarily waste is, is probably the wrong term for it, but you don't, you don't understand how much time you put into things until you kind of objectively look at it for an entire year. Like if you freed up an hour a week or two hours a week to work on something like a hobby or your own company, you'd actually get quite far within a year. Sure. You're probably not going as fast as you'd maybe like to, but you could still build something, right? Is, is that kind of what you're getting at as well? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, you, you just hit the nail right on the head. There, there's many, many, many ways, a lot of things that people can do that we can build things and just getting out of sitting in front of a computer all day is, uh, is step one or your cell phone for that matter. Sure. Well, and I think it also gives people the ability to go out to events and network and, and you guys are doing a bunch of events obviously in the summit go to those things right like meet the actual people that you look at their photos every day yep um and, and that's always one of the first steps that i give to people and, and a lot of people are telling me you know what what should i do um and it's always just try uh, try yeah. do something new. Get out somewhere new. Talk to somebody new. What's the worst that's going to happen if you talk to somebody new and you introduce yourself and they don't necessarily want to meet with you? Uh, and going back to my story with Jeff Vinnick, what was the yeah. worst that, that was going to happen? Is he was just going to either say no, yeah, or he was not going to respond. And I'd be in the exact same place that I was in one hour before, or a day before, or a month before. Yeah. Um, but one conversation. Just going up and one like getting the ump in me to go up and say hi and introduce myself and talk, give a quick elevator pitch on what I'm doing, um, it changed my life it, in all yeah. honesty. And, and yeah. I've told him that afterwards. Um, you know, in the last few months, I've gotten a little bit of recognition and I sent him a thank you note about it because it was just so nice of the things that he had done that really changed my life just because he responded to that email and he said, let's have the meeting. And, and that's a way that it, it's just a lesson in itself that it would not happen without even taking that shot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, what's that famous quote? Like you miss a hundred percent of the Wayne, shots you never Wayne take. The Wayne Gretzky quote. Yeah. Yep. Right. And, and it's it, the other thing too, is I've had other people on the show and I've done it myself where I've reached out to somebody and that in all honesty, probably shouldn't have written back to me because their time was way more valuable. Right. And I'm, I will openly say that, but yep. they took the time and I've had it where you reach out to somebody and they've spent 20, 30 minutes on an email back to you about, whatever you ask them for, right? Or I've had them meet up with you. And it sounds like obviously you've had the same, similar kind of uh, experience. So you never know. Sure, there'll be people you'll reach out to and you never hear back from, but that doesn't mean you should stop and give up and never keep trying. You never know what you, will come of it, right? You just never know. Uh, you don't know what's gonna happen next. You don't know who's gonna say yes. And nobody can say yes to you if, if you don't give them that opportunity. 
uh, a lot of people are afraid of failure and it's yep. it's the human psyche the way the human psyche works is we think negatively better than we think positively totally but you really should uh, I try to think of it another way is try to enable success and, and back in you know, one of my previous I'll call it previous lives uh, did a little bit of poker playing like everybody okay. else did back in the, the mid 2000s sure. um, and was teaching my dad how to play and he was always like, oh, well, I don't want to do that because I'm afraid to lose. I'm like, well, if you're afraid to lose, you're never going to win. It, yeah, it's, you totally. have to be willing to take that fear and put yourself out and let yourself hang out there. Now, don't throw all caution to the wind. Uh, sure. It, different people have different uh, risk assessment in them. Um, I always like to do uh, strategic risk or calculated risk and, and sure. to what I'm comfortable with. But an introduction, networking, having a conversation, a follow-up email, uh, a handshake, a hello, a phone call. No one's ever going to hate you for doing that. Totally. I 100% agree. And I don't think failure has to be such a negative thing. It, it always comes across like, oh, I failed at this. It's like, well, but it, it's chances are your failure isn't life ending, right? It's just, okay, this, you tried this one thing, it failed, but you learned something and you tried something else and you might have to try five or six, 10, a hundred things before it actually works. But why is that bad? Right. I, I never understood that. Yep. And, and that's the entrepreneurs who are successful. Those are the ones who have failed and then they failed and then they yeah. failed yeah. and then they failed yeah. and then they failed and then they failed. Yeah. And they kept failing until they, they don't even remember it. how many times they've failed, right? Like it's been so many. You you get over it very quickly. And that's why when I go through my story, I always like talking about the early stage uh, of uh, the recommendation engine. It's called Rhino. Um, right. Uh, and because Rhino really was a failure, but that failure helped point me in a direction towards success. And I like to celebrate the fact that I tried it. I took the step. I threw myself out there. I spent a little bit of money. I was cautious about the amount that I spent. I didn't go crazy on it. Yeah. But if I look at the failure that took place and what lessons I took from that failure, I would not be the person I am today if I had not taken that step. No, makes a lot of sense. Well, and fair, like you lost thousands of dollars instead of 150 grand, right? Yep. That's a huge difference. So no, that makes a lot of sense. But Brian, we're out of time. So let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about all the stuff you guys are doing, the platform, the events, the summit, check out the book and any other links you want to mention. Yeah, absolutely. Um, go to synapsefl.com. So S-Y-N-A-P-S-C-F-L.com. Um, and that will get you the uh, that website will get you to anything as it relates to our challenges, our platform. Check out Synapse Connect, the platform. Uh, it'll link you straight to the event website, which does have its own separate URL because it's taken on a life form of its own. If you want to go straight to the event, go to synapsesummit.com. Um, again, synapsesummit.com. And that will get you all the information. You can stay up to date with the latest speakers, who's coming. Uh, exhibitors, sponsors, people who will be around the arena, um, and it's going to be very, very exciting. And and, and one thing, um, just to to end on, if I if I may, sure. um, I always love quotes um, sure. and, and nice motivational things. I have a whole wall of them up in my office. Um, but one of them that I always stick by, and this has a little bit to do with me being a University of Michigan graduate, since this quote's by Jim Harbaugh, the head football coach. But it really resonates with me, and it, it should resonate with a lot of entrepreneurs. A and his quote is, if your friends aren't laughing at your dreams, you're not aiming high enough. Yeah, that's and a really good one. It, it, I just, I love it, and I think about that. And so uh, I really, anybody who's listening, aim high, dream high. There is no too high for you to aim or dream. Sure. Um, and my own personal dream and I just put it out to the world because you never know is to one day own a sports team. And I know I got to do a lot to be able to get there. Um, sure. I, I, there's billions of dollars that need to be made before I can get there, but I'm hoping I'm putting myself on that path to success. The secondary dream is to make Tampa Bay and the state of Florida, the world's next great innovation economy and community. And right. we are well, well, well on our way there. And I'm thrilled just to even be a part of it. 
Very cool, man. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.